what I've noticed in this time of crisis is that our community is doing what it does best and that's pulling together and working in community. And so I'm really happy to be here to share part of my practice and I hope there's something interesting for, your, for you all in there. Um, my, if you don't know who I am, my name's Natalie Rodriguez. I'm a professor at the Alberta University of the Arts, which is up here in Calgary, Canada. Um, we have an undergraduate and a graduate program. Um, I'm also the president of the Glass Art Society and um, I'll talk about sort of all of that as we go along. Um, if there's any questions, I can't really see the chat screen, but if you feel if you feel like you have a burning question and you want to ask it, just type it in and then I can answer it uh, once I turn off my slideshow. And I'm of course happy to answer any questions once we're at the end too. So um, I'm naming this talk Palim Set, uh, an approach to practice, because I was thinking about complexity and uh, um, complexity and sort of uh, minimalism. So I work in a kind of minimalist way, but there's some irreducible complexities that are difficult to, um, to not acknowledge. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about is that I, my background is a little bit complex. Um, in a lot of ways, I feel totally Canadian because of it. Uh, I was born in Africa. My mother's German, my father's East Indian, and then my last name is Rodriguez. And it makes sense in a sort of colonial context that I'm happy to answer afterwards. But um, uh, I grew up mostly in Alberta. Um, this, is, this image is from about 45 minutes away from here. I feel pretty lucky in living in one of the most beautiful places around. So in one direction, there's the Rocky Mountains. In another direction, there's the Badlands, um, which is sort of a desert landscape. Uh, to the north and to the south are prairies. So I'm surrounded in 45 minutes, I can get into a completely different landscape. And in my work, uh, the experience of the landscape becomes a really important part of it. I'm very interested in uh, notions of uh, grace and transcendency. Oops. And also in uh, sort of storytelling. So this is an image from the Badlands. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of older pieces. So this is work from my undergraduate. Uh, it's based on an amphora form. Uh, I was looking into sort of I, ways that families construct identity, and especially in a family like mine, which uh, comes from a couple of different kinds of diasporas. Um, and so I don't feel like I'm cut adrift from that family story. Like I don't feel uh, that I don't have access to the East Indian stories or that, that side of the family. I don't feel like I'm cut adrift from the German side of the family. I can tell you stories from my great grandparents' home in Prussia <laughs> and also my great grandparents' home in Karachi, India. So there's, there's a connection and that connection for our family comes through storytelling rather than through a sense of geography. And so when I was in my undergraduate, I was thinking about um, the ways these stories exist and continue and evolve and I was using the idea of epic poems specifically the Odyssey um, and the Iliad and Gilgamesh as a way to interrogate uh, fragments of stories and how they're left behind and so I was using the amphora which was of course a uh, kind of container that was used in the Mediterranean basin quite extensively and with each of, of the transport of these or uh, um, you know, uh, camel trains, they would always bring a storyteller and they would tell stories and those fragments would sort of exist or remain and get folded into other stories. So if we look at Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, uh, fragments of Gilgamesh exist in the Odyssey, in A Thousand and One Nights, there's examples of it in the Bible. And so these kind of fragments remain and evolve. I keep doing that. So in my effort to sort of reconnect or connect with parts of the family story, when I finished my undergraduate, I walked across Spain. There's a fairly famous pilgrimage called the Road to Santiago. Um, it is the only place you can still get an indulgence in the Catholic Church. Um, and my grandparents, who were geologists and geographers, had mapped to this area of Spain fairly intensively. And my aunt on my father's side had always wanted to do it and so it kind of exists in this uh, mythic realm this road in my family 
It was talked about a lot. And so I thought, what the hell? Let's walk across faith. And so I did do that and then uh, created a body of, or did my uh, graduate work based on that experience at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, and so I built this installation, uh, and unfortunately, I only know the dimensions in uh, meters. <laughs> so you have a big giant room. On one end is this sort of blood red plinth with a casting on it. The casting contains a uh, sort of ring of light in it. And against the back wall, there are blown glass objects that um, sort of echo that notion of a ring. And so the, they sit on a, a curved wall in the back there. It's dark blue. The wall is uh, five meters long and four meters tall. And I was really thinking about how to represent this liminal experience, this moment of transcendency and transformative experience uh, in a way that is kind of ageographical. Um, and uh, because basically, you know, it can happen anywhere. It doesn't, you don't have to be on a pilgrimage to have this experience of grace or otherness. Um, you know, some people call it flow. Uh, some other people call it the zone. It's a kind of moment of uh, hyper concentration. And so um, this is close up of the work. I was really interested in thinking about how the hand might be telegraphed. Uh, and I don't know if you've all seen these, but some old uh, pilgrimage sites or some older sculptures uh, or even like public sculptures have spots that are kind of rubbed by people's hands. So there's a famous dog in Edinburgh that they have to always re-black because people keep rubbing its nose and then its muzzle just goes more and more um, bronze. So I was thinking about how that how the hand or touch could be expressed on the surfaces of these things. Um, and I did that through cold working. Uh, and then lighting. So presence, the act of being present or the act of just being there with your material is very, very important for me. So when I was cold working those sort of uh, toroid forms for my grad show, um, my whole practice was to try and be as present with the work as possible and react to the surface. And I started doing these drawings during that time. I do them, I still do them every once in a while. Um, I use the smallest brush I can find and a bottle ink and a 22 by 30 sheet of paper. And then just put small little dots down. And I use the same brush. And as the brush degrades, the trick is to try and be as present enough to get the same round shape and the same size dot. And it becomes very difficult. <laughs> and uh, but you can, see, you can see my concentration where I'm paying more attention and less attention. And for me, that's a really important thing to, be, to have a record of presence. So I have some influences. Um, and I'm not gonna sort of go through all of them, but I have a, a short list uh, that I can just tell you out loud. Uh, so uh, Olafur Eliasson, Barbara Hepworth, uh, the Lubinskys, uh, you know, Mat uh, Matisse. The list is really super long. Some of my favorite philosophers, one of them at least, is a fellow by the name of Kwame Anthony Appiah. He wrote a book called Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers. And because identity plays a sort of, you know, it's this kind of theme that sort of runs through my work in a more or less overt way. I think he writes the most clearly on that, that I found at least. Um, so a little bit back to Africa. This is a uh, hand axe that came from Kenya. So it was, there was a hand axe quarry from the Paleolithic. Um, it is not the best example from that site. It is not uh, it, anyway, so it's, it's very, very old. And the thing is, this thing fits my hand. Like it, I can kind of figure out how to use it. You know, I, I don't know how to make it, but it is something that is possibly or impossibly old and it still fits my hand. And so here's this object that is from, you know, prehistory and perhaps even pre-modern human history that just fits my hand. And so as a kid, 
And as a maker now, as someone who's a bit older with a bit more experience, that object still intrigues me. It's still something that is uh, kind of unbelievable. This is another piece that's really deeply influenced my work. It's a painting by Matthias Grunewald. It is from uh, the Isenheim altar. And so it's actually the altar piece that, that is the, the influence, not just necessarily this image. Um, so the altar piece opens and closes over the, the course of the year. And so you see different images uh, for different celebrations. What I find particularly wonderful about this image is that at, at the arisen Christ's feet is are people who are bloated and covered in boils and who look uh, unbelievable to our eyes. Now, those were the people that this painting was painted for. So those bodies were the ones that they would have understood. And this perfect image of someone without blemishes other than the signs of the crucifixion would have been the unbelievable image. And so there's this reversal of how we as modern people see this medieval painting. And this moment of, of understanding or of truth is inverse for us. And so there's, again, there's something deeply interesting about that. I'm also, you know, curious about this notion of um, a kind of pilgrimage uh, without movement. So over the course of the year, you could see all these images pop up and change in a way that, uh, that if you were infirmed, you wouldn't be able to participate in otherwise. So, and of course the Lubinskys. And this is one made by Yuroslava Brichtova, the mold. Um, I think you probably all know that Stanislav was the designer. They worked as a team. Yuroslava would make the, the clay models and then cast them. And I just think that the objects themselves as ink clay are as transcendent as the objects that are made out of glass. All right, so complexity. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as artists, we work, um, we kind of braid together this diversity of thinking and of image making and of context and of opportunity. And when I think about places that have really influenced my practice, you know, walking across Spain was a pretty big deal, but then going to Pilchuk was even a bigger deal. Because here's this place where everyone has an interest in the material that we work with, but we, they have an interest in the material in a very divergent way. And so if you get a chance to go there, all of a sudden you're exposed to, you know, 300 different ways of thinking about glass making and 300 different ways of, of conceptualizing material that you would never have an opportunity to be steeped in that rich of an environment otherwise. And of course, there's other places to go like Haystack and um, Penland. Uh, but this is the one that I've had a bit more experience with. And so that's why I'm talking about it. I'm not saying it's the only one, um, but I'm saying it's the one that's had a big effect on my life. Um, this is another artist who's, who's been a deep influence in my work. His name is Buster Simpson. Uh, if you don't know his work, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. His work around the Anthropocene and um, marking climate change is earth-shatteringly beautiful and heartbreaking, all at the same time. Um, he built this uh, treehouse when they were building Pilchuk. So it's about 40, well, actually, I guess it's 50 years old, close to 50 years old now. This is another place that's influenced me deeply. Um, this is Northlands Creative Glass. I guess they go by Northlands Creative now. It's in Leipster, Scotland, which is in the far north of Scotland. And it's an extraordinary place. You know, uh, when you go up there and there's a bunch of Europeans, they, they always talk about how empty the landscape is and how few humans they are. And as someone who comes from Canada, where there are moments where there are literally no indications that humans have ever have inhabited the landscape um, or more importantly you know you're driving for 600 or 600 kilometers or a thousand kilometers and there's no cell reception because you're in the middle of nowhere the only thing that's there is the road and the bears and no cell towers and so in Scot scotland there's um everywhere you look there's signs of human habitation and the reshaping of the earth for agriculture. And it takes, uh, I won't say it this way, I'll say it another way. Very interesting people go to the Northlands because it's a trek. 
it's a journey to get there. And once you're there, uh, again, you're immersed in this um, space that is about generative ideation and making. All right, that's enough about Northlands, except for this one more image. So Northlands is at the confluence between the North Sea and the Atlantic. And so it is an incredibly wild seascape. It's very, very diverse in terms of um, sea life and bird life. Uh, but what I was interested in is this idea that um, I had this moment looking, watching the sea and watching boats and thinking about the still point and thinking about uh, things that are immovable. And so that's been the research for my, uh, for my body of work for the last few years, you know, thinking about um, stillness and silence as a transformative experience, but also as a bulwark against change. And so uh, it comes from, it, I started thinking about that at this site. So my process is about a kind of metabolizing of experience. And so I immerse myself in landscape. I immerse myself in reading and in experience. And then I start to, to do a lot of maquette making, a lot of drawing, and sort of trying to get the work into my hands so that I can actually bring it into the world in, in a way that resonates with what I'm trying to ask of the work and find an answer as well, maybe. Um, but one of the things I do sort of as habit and par for the course is I photograph light. And I do it sort of, I don't, necessarily search it out but I try and keep my eyes open for interesting scenarios. So this is uh, just walking one day and noticing that um, the light was doing something strange and photographing it. Because I think what we do, I think as artists or glass artists in particular, we carve light. You know we manipulate it, it is the material that we work with. Glass is merely the scrim on which it sits or transmits through. Um, I also spent a lot of time looking at snow living in, North, in Canada <laughs> and thinking about sort of forms and erosion and uh, those kinds of things and mark making. Uh, because I do see drawing as a big part of my practice as well. Sometimes I like to take photos of drawings in nature and mark making in nature. And then, you know, once I, I have a sense of what, what I'm trying to answer, I start doing a lot of drawings and doing a lot of maquettes. This is a small maquette I did actually at Northlands with a piece of Caithness stone, a billet of bullseye and some cardboard. And so maquette making can be an incredible tool because it allows you to ideate your ideas so quickly without investing hundreds or thousands of dollars into materials or time. And so I often make hundreds of drawings and make a whole ton of maquettes. And as soon as I feel that that work, like it feels like it's in my hands, because the way I draw and the way I carve glass and the way I carve um, materials like foam or clay or wax, is the same way that I move my hand when I'm, when I'm working with material. So, um, especially when I'm cross-hatching. And so I feel like I practice the work before I actually get there and I feel like it's in my body. So this is a drawing that, um, <coughs> pardon me, um, this is a drawing that comes from that uh, little piece of bullseye glass and the uh, cake nest stone where I recognized fairly early on that what I was interested or intrigued by was this space between things and how objects arrive together and sort of the proximity and touch of two disparate objects as they, as they sit together. And so the work um, evolved, and I'll show you some pictures later on. This is work that I did for my sabbatical or some drawings that I did for my sabbatical. And that was a challenging experience. And I'll get, when I get there, I can tell you why. Um, and then these are some of my smaller maquettes. Again, thinking about material, thinking about object, thinking about, um, relative value of things. So this is all bottle glass that I've carved out. Um, and I'm still kind of playing with that idea quite a bit. And this is just um, 
something that I've been thinking about a lot, and that's uh, bowls or plates that change the surface on which they sit. You know, thinking about um, leaves or a flora that has some kind of significance to it. So obviously the lily pad, a lotus leaf, and this is a laurel leaf. And thinking about making uh, serving objects that have um, these leaves on it that then end up printing a shadow on your table. This is one of my sort of sculptural maquettes. This is uh, made in the hot shop and then cold worked. Uh, thinking again about the hand, thinking about tools, thinking about boats and internal volumes. I'm sure you've all noticed this, but you know, with glass, it's different than other materials in that you're not using the skin to define the object. The skin is not what we look at as glass artists. We look at the interstices or the volume of the object or the way the volume distorts the background. And so the glass as a material can act both as ghost, as tool, and as a literal transformative object. Um, and this is some more of that work uh, with bottle glass. And these have been a challenge for me in the most wonderful way, in that um, I kind of, when I was making them, I was, I was reading a little too much maybe about the anth Anthropocene, you know, reading a little too much about Armageddon. And this started a few years ago, and one of the books that I read was by Thomas Merton called Hyper Objects. And I can only, if you're interested in climate change and uh, uh, kind of notions of Armageddon, um, Hyper Objects is a fantastic book. Um, and so then I was thinking about the end of the world, and I was also thinking about the Neolithic and the hand tools that uh, you know, I'd seen and that had been such a great influence in my work in terms of form and in terms of that hand axe that we looked at earlier and thinking about how we know how to use things by our biology and by our bilateral symmetry and by our hand. And so I started thinking about, well, what happens if we make, if I make tools for the future, for, you know, the end of the world. And uh, so in my mind, I was making these things for ritual, hospitality and sort of sacrifice. You know, not really knowing what those rituals or sacrifices might be, but I'm imagining that it could be pollen or something like delicious in this little sort of boat shaped uh, dish made out of, uh, you know, a bubbly water bottle. And then also thinking about spoons and uh, ways to serve things. And so in my mind, I had this image of this work sitting in a natural history museum or in an anthropological museum where it was sort of sitting distanced from the world or outside of time as ob objects often are when they um, sit in museums. And I'll show you some images later on uh, with some of the results of that investigation because I can tell you I learned a lot and it was all very surprising. So um, I'm not gonna talk much about Bill Viola, Viola other than he's um, a deeply interesting artist. And this notion of living in an indivisible world is one that sort of really uh, underpins my work. So these are my, see, some of my objects now. Uh, a lacuna is a spot in a painting where the, painting, the paint has fallen off and so you have an empty spot without information. And I was thinking about perception quite a bit when I was making this work and thinking how when we see something, it can look like it is a full rounded object, but actually it's quite a flattened form. I was thinking about meniscus and I was thinking about how um, glass can reflect and transform the environment. So these objects were meant to be seen sort of, they would sit on a low plinth, you would look down at the plinth and look into them. Where you see the darker sort of gray, uh, in those objects, there's sort of like a bright white spot at the very top, in the very middle, and the sort of band of sort of gray around the edges. Uh, when you were, when you went into the gallery, you could walk around them, and you'd see sort of from your, from your shoulders down, and you could see the entire room, but the bright spot in the middle stayed blank. People also often assumed that it was filled with water, so there were a lot of people poking them with their fingers, 
to sort of see what they were, which I thought was great. Made the gallery owner a bit uncomfortable, but it's, it's really about thinking about space and thinking about, about the space behind and around you uh, when you're not, you know, it's not something that you often consider. The other thing is, again, the shapes were quite different than what you perceived them to be. And sometimes the only way to actually understand the form was to touch it. This is uh, a piece from that proximity and touch series. Uh, you can see how that drawing became a glass object. This is cast. It's about, I think it's about 14 inches tall. No, it's a little taller than that. Let's call it 16 inches tall and about 11 wide. This is um, other work from Proximity and Touch. Uh, a cast black, uh, the black object is cast glass. The, um, the little or colored object is made out of uh, gaffer crystal. I was really interested too in, in these small objects that would fit in your hand. And as you hold them, they actually start to pick up your body heat. Um, and in touching uh, you know, the, that big giant soda lime block, you know, that always stays cool. It doesn't matter how hot it is outside, it's always a cool thing to touch. I was looking at how um, color can resist darkness uh, and thinking about how, you know, scale can be subverted. So that, you know, in these objects, the thing that's really the most important thing to see is those small little objects as they resist those dark forms. Um, you can probably see that little green piece is, uh, has a lot of cording in it. And when it's in the gallery, people don't believe that it's not ridged. So they often pick it up to try and feel the, the sort of visual ripples. Um, it's also quite sharp at the edge, not sharp enough to cut you, but just sharp enough to maybe give you a little bit of a start. Um, again, you know, thinking about presence and sight and perception. The other thing with, generally with my work, is that I'm not discouraged or discomforted if people touch my work. Um, often there's a sign that says don't touch the work, uh, and then people very carefully touch the work. And the reason I don't have a sign that says please pick everything up is because people tend to be rough when you give them permission. But if they're breaking the rules, if they're sort of going against the dominant culture, in a gallery, they are doing it so carefully and they move from sort of being a viewer to being a performer. And all of a sudden the work becomes uh, heterotropic rather than utopic in nature. And so as they're touching the work, they fall into a moment of being present, they fall into that zone or into that liminal space and they are with the work in a way that they can't be if they're only looking at it. And it's the same thing when a viewer, when someone comes into the gallery and there's someone having a moment and touching the work, they see that person and they all of a sudden, you know, step into another space as well. Um, I remember at my grad show, my mother, who's an anthropologist, uh, was like giving me a big lecture about how no one would break the gallery rules and how it would be impossible for them to do it, especially if there wasn't a sign telling them. And as she was saying it, some fellow had come off the street into the gallery had looked around very carefully and just noticed my mom and I in deep conversation and he leaned against one of my castings and rubbed his rubbed his cheek against it very carefully and then he looked around embarrassed and walked away <laughs> so um it can happen and you can be surprised when it happens uh but I do think you can play with subtle cues to activate the work in a way that you can't activate say a painting because if you touch a painting Sometimes you wreck it very easily. Um, this is a design I made uh, quite a few years ago for a fundraiser at the school. Uh, it's called Rio. Um, in West Africa, there are a class or a, yeah, there's a class or a clan of storytellers that hold history and are the ones in charge of the sort of oral um, library of that area. And so, you know, I was thinking about blood, I was thinking about um, specifically red blood cells and oxygen and the transmission of information. Again, you know, that, uh, that idea is uh, sort of a, another sort of subtext in my work. 
So when we think about those um, pieces of glass that I carved, that I had these high ideals for, I was thinking, um, you know, it's, uh, I was thinking about galleries, I was thinking about museums, I was thinking about something maybe slightly extraordinary. And as a way to interrogate the work, because I knew that I was probably wrong, and I was, knew that I was probably, I was missing something important with these pieces. So I would give them out. I would uh, give them to artists that I met and ask them in return to send a photo back, but to think about these ideas of ritual and of um, hospitality and of sacrifice and memorial maybe. And so this is Evie Cohen, who's a phenomenal glassmaker and photo photographer in Paris. Um, and then these are little uh, sort of pat de verre lozenges with decals of her and her brother on e each one of, on the left is I think Evie and then on the right I think is her brother. It could be the, right, the other way around, I can't remember. Um, but at any rate, so thinking about uh, memory and thinking about um, time and time lost. This is uh, the image I got back from Alison Kinnaird, who is a fabulous uh, engraver in Scotland. She is incredibly well known for two things, being one of the top copper wheel engravers in the world, and then also being a top harp player. And so she's recovered hundreds of Highland harping tunes that had been lost to history, um, but was able to recover them through uh, understanding the music had been transcribed for other instruments. Anyway, so this is Alison's uh, interpretation of the work. And this is uh, a wonderful woman's work. Now she is uh, an amazing fuser on the East Coast, does really, really beautiful, beautiful work. And she sent this image back and I hadn't anticipated anyone actually using them. I hadn't thought about them as functional objects, which is hilarious because I make, you know, one of my favorite things to make is bowls. And so, you know, if I'm blowing glass and I have some time where I don't have to be serious, I make bowls because they're amazing. And so functional is not something that I ever thought that I would be surprised by. And so I was deeply surprised in her using this for tartar sauce for fish and chips. And I talked to her about it afterwards. And it turns out that she and her husband, who both have very, very busy lives, only really have one standing date. One time that they just set aside for themselves and they go to the pub down the street and they have fish and chips. And it's really just about the two of them eating and having a lovely time. And so for her, that is the ritual that make, brings her a deep sense of joy and grounding. And so taking my piece there was a sort of celebration of the object or bringing the object into that moment of celebration. And um, I realized that I needed to rethink it all. <laughs> and so this body of work is still ongoing. Um, I'm still, I think I'm trying to make them a bit more functional and less, le a little less um, fragile. Uh, so these spoons work great. Uh, anyway, so I talked a little bit about my sabbatical and looking at the still point. And I'd done a bit of reading into Zen and thinking about stillness and uh, thought that I would look at two landscapes and sort of compare them because in some ways they, they share a lot of similarities and some and in others there's nothing similar about the landscapes. So one was the Big Island in Hawaii. It's in the middle of the ocean, as we all know. Uh, the Big Island is so heavy that it's distorted the tectonic plate by 20,000 feet. It's also a space that, um, because it's in the middle of the Pacific, gets battered constantly by deep ocean waves and by storms. And so it's going through this process of, of becoming and being erased. And so I was curious about that in terms of, again, because it was in the middle of, of something, because it was an island, um, because it was in the ocean that was always moving, I was pretty sure that the island was the still point. And as I walked around and looked at some of the lava flows and thought about uh, the transformation of the landscape, I realized that what I wasn't looking at was stillness. What I was looking at was a constant moment of creation, that the world was coming into being 
every second that I was there. And that as you're standing there, sometimes the earth is heaving up and down as the magma moves through the tubes. And so even me standing still on the landscape was moving according to how, how the ground underneath me was heaving. And so I was a little bit disappointed because I was pretty sure I was right. And this is the problem with thinking that you're right is sometimes you're not right at all. And so as I watched this space coming into being, as I watched it being born and transformed from a space that uh, had never been to one that was starting to return to kind of um, moment in time, uh, I started to think about how I could possibly compare it to the other location because it was so new, because it was so, um, again, in this moment of creation. The second spot that I went to is a place called Uluru. It used to be called Ayers Rock. It's, uh, it's in Australia. It's in the middle of the desert. It stands sort of by itself with its neighbor, um, Katajuja, which is, was known as the Olgas. So Ayers Rock and the Big Island, Uluru and the Big Island, are both sites of two kinds of pilgrimages or two kinds of spaces. One is a kind of secular space, a tourist space. The other is kind of an indigenous space. And they both hold importance in sort of both those communities. Now, personally, I tend to think that the indigenous ownership of the land is much more important than the, um, than the tourist uh, space. But I was just interested as a site. Um, and so I got to Ayers Rock. Uh, and I need Uluru, and it is, uh, it's formed through the erosion of a mountain range. So millions of years ago, a mountain range eroded into an alluvial fan. That alluvial fan gets compressed under the ocean. Some more geological stuff happens, and it pops up. And it's six, kilom six and a half kilometers under the sand layer. And you'll have to excuse me, I'm just gonna guess. I think that's three miles, it could be more. But at any rate, it's six and a half kilometers underneath the sand. And the thing that's amazing about Uluru is that, uh, that it is like an iceberg because it's sitting free in that sand landscape. And so as I was walking around it, you know, and looking at it and considering it, it has so much iron in it that it has its own microclimate. So when you're walking, it might be 45 degrees Celsius, and let's call that 120. I don't know, I made that 120, up. it's hot. Um, as you're walking around it, the walls of the mountain or the rock are also hitting you with radiant heat. So it's like walking around a candling glory hole. It just, it, it's, it's uh, hot and it's intense. The other thing is, is that um, that red color comes from the iron rusting. And that if you see a chip off Uluru and it exposes the rock underneath, it's actually a blue-gray color. And so it's, it's a, a space that changes. Um, it's geologically incredibly stable. It's, um, I'm just gonna check the time, make sure that I'm not talking your ears off. Okay, uh, anyway, so it's incredibly ge geologically stable. Um, the only thing that affects it and changes it is rain and wind. But there are three watering holes around Uluru that have never run dry in the entire songline history. And the songlines are maybe 40,000 years old. So there are these three spots that offer shelter and security and safety in a landscape that can be fairly inhospitable um, and drought and fire ridden. And so um, there are these little pockets of oases sort of around the rock that as you step from the path that isn't part of the tree canopy into the tree canopy it is a riot of sound because of all of the birds and so as I was spending time there I realized that again I was wrong that again this isn't a spot of silence or of stillness or of a bulwark against change that this was another site from which creation springs so <laughs> I've spent a bit of time trying to figure out what it is that I saw and what I experienced. And so I'm still 
kind of in the drawing and maquette making stage. Um, that process, so I go into a landscape, I experience it, I do, um, I try and be as present as I can in that landscape. I often do drawings, I often uh, do a bit of writing, take tons of photos, I go home, I kind of try and metabolize that information. And then as soon as I feel it in my hands, that's when I start to make. I haven't got to that point quite yet. Um, this is the only spot on Uluru where you can climb to the top, or you could climb to the top. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen images of people walking up the rock. What's interesting is because the rock gets so hot, the rubber from people's shoes has um, left a layer of residue up the side so that it became, I mean, it's really dangerous to climb on one hand, uh, but that layer of rubber created an, an additional hazard. Now, the important thing to know about Uluru is that it was returned to native ownership uh, probably in, like, I'm going to say 99. I'm not sure. I can't remember quite if that's right. It might have been 2001. It was somewhere around there. Um, and it's not meant to be climbed. It's too sacred. And the stuff that happens at the top in terms of Indigenous ceremony is really for the initiate only and for the people who are part of that culture and community and nation. And so uh, they've closed it, and so you can't climb it anymore, which is great, I think, for a bunch of reasons. Um, but in the meantime, you have this mark that's been left by the transgressions of others. Here's another image of it. So, you know, I'm hoping that, that the things that I can telegraph, you know, when thinking about Palimpsest, you know, it is about um, a moment of uh, putting information down, erasing it, putting more information down, erasing it, so that you have these echoes of the things that, you're, that you've been doing, the process that arrives at the final work. And for me, that process includes service and includes acting in community. Um, again, you know, I, I think as a, as a community, the glass, the glassies have um, a particularly wonderful opportunity. I think we are part of a global network. I think we are part of a community that works together. We're trained to work together early on, and that is a rich and endemic part of who we are. And so part of my, um, my need to be part of community or my need to be of service in some way is to be on the gas board. Um, I've been on the gas board now for six years. I've been the president for the last three. Um, I feel deeply, deeply, deeply privileged to have been the president for the Murano Conference and for the St. Peter's Conference and it, uh, St. Petersburg, sorry, <laughs> and then also for the Sweden Conference, even though uh, we had to cancel the on site conference. So um, I want to encourage you all to volunteer and be part of something that enriches our community. If we think of Pilchuck, if we think of Northlands, if we think of Canberra Glassworks, if we think of all of the university programs, if we think of the public access facilities, all of that has arisen because we've worked together. And I think as we move through the pandemic and the economic upheaval that is coming towards us, it's the only way we're going to survive is to band together and do things that haven't been done before. And I know we can do it because we've done it before. <laughs> anyway, so um, Murano uh, and the Venetian Conference, uh, again, is probably one of the pinnacles of my career in life. Um, we built a conference site on the island. Uh, the Venetian mayor, or the Venice mayor, uh, the, yeah, the Venetian mayor was, came and gave an opening remark. He's like, I had no idea you could do this in Venice. And we're like, a little elbow grease and some money. It's amazing what you can do. Um, so it allows, being part of GAS has allowed me to do things that I couldn't have imagined at a scale that I couldn't have imagined. And so this is us touring the site um, before uh, the conference started. Um, this is the Moretti studio. If anyone lamp works, this is where Effortre and Moretti glass are made. And again, a bit of richness. Um, and in traveling, you get to see things you would have never expected. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of value in the internet. I think there's a lot of value in books, tons of value in books. 
but to experience it and experience the complexity of being there and you know tasting the food and smelling the air and looking at the history of things in situ you can't replace it so these are two little glass objects i think they're vanini i think they're from the 30s um, but they're just glorious and they were just sitting in the sort of gelatinous quietness in the corner and uh yeah i think i'm gonna have to be thinking about these objects for a long time there's something about them that i think uh still has a bit to teach me about our material and the way that we think um this is the very first grawl made in sweden so this is the first grawl of all times i think it was like 19 10 maybe 1908 Simon Gate um, was the designer again working in community you know working together uh, gaming things out it's what we do best and again I feel incredibly blessed you know people often say that when I tell them that I'm the president they always like commiserate they're always like oh I'm so sorry that must be so much work it must be so hard yeah it's all those things but it's also freaking great. It's also amazing to be able to, to be part of the team that constructs the, um, the sheet music, if you will, right? Or the score that ends up being played or being engaged in so many different ways that we can't even imagine. So I almost think of it as a jazz score, right? We'll, we'll give you the melody and you people do whatever you want with it. And so that experience of working together, anyway, I could wax on and on about it, but I'll stop now. Just know that going to a gas conference is a great thing and I think you should all do it. Um, and there might be an announcement from gas pretty soon about something that's happening, let's say in May. So keep your eyes out. Um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is my home institution, which was called the Alberta College of Art and Design. Um, and now is called the Alberta University of the Arts. Um, we are a fairly small school, uh, but we're one of four independent art schools, uh, public independent art schools across Canada. So there's four of us, uh, four of us. Um, we're, the only, uh, we're the only one with glass. And this is just some of our equipment. Um, we've got a lot of stuff. Nadine's been there. She can talk to you about the space. Um, and this is some of our students. And you can see that sometimes we're far too serious and other times not serious enough. Uh, we have a pretty active visiting artist program. Um, this is Jay McDonnell working with my colleague, Tyler Rock. And the students are all roped in in one way or the other, either with torches or paddles to help out. This is um, one of my third year students work. Uh, she's really interested in the microbiome including the fossil record. Um, we're pretty close to a place called Frank Slide, which is, um, not sorry, not Frank Slide. Uh, oh, geez, Louise, it's by Frank Slide. Anyway, it's one of the greatest fossil records uh, on earth and it, because it shows uh, a great volume of time. Um, and I'm not gonna remember the name the longer I talk, I'm sorry. Uh, if you're interested, I can always like send you the information. Uh, anyway, so she's interested in 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 this the microbiome and sort of the the wonder and the majesty and the sort of diversity that you find in that in the small record. So these are um, images that she's engraved on glass plates and then projected them onto the wall. This is another student looking at anxiety, thinking about um, how to how to show someone what anxiety feels like when you don't have it. And so this is the work that she's done, cast her own hands, used, um, uh, the, used the mold to cast two, two sets of hands, one out of plaster, one out of cement, and used the plaster hands to blow those objects onto so that they're perfectly registered. These are some of the people I get to work with. Tyler Rock, Marty Kaufman, Jill Allen, Robert Lewis, and Lisa Cerny is our brilliant technician. She is uh, amazing at grawl work and really interested in uh, sort of image making, but very bad at documenting her work. So this is the image she gave me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is some of our alumni. 
uh, Dana McLean. These are banana holsters with a marketing campaign. <laughs> and so you can see those, uh, yeah, and you're, they're pretty funny. Melanie Long and Kai Schofield. <laughs>